All right, we are live. We're here with Master Angel Salona from Impact Martial Arts. Thank you, ma'am, for joining me today. My pleasure. How's it going today? Good. We have a we're going into a holiday weekend and riding on the tailcoats of a big bank contest win this week. <laughs> so we're all smiles right now. Awesome. Do you want to lead with that? Do you want to you want to talk about that? Uh, since you just brought it up, we can we can start with that since it's sure. you and know. probably anybody that's watching heard about it because I was begging and begging every person I knew to vote for Impact Martial Arts. Uh, one of our students told us that uh, their local bank, Howard Bank, was hosting a contest for small businesses. I said, "Oh, thanks. We'll definitely apply." So I, George, and I wrote four essays together and we wrote them probably 15 times. We made sure we're absolutely perfect in what we wanted to say. And then we got a notification uh, that we made it into the top 15. So we started emailing and texting and Facebooking. Hey, we, we, we made it into the top 15 for this contest. Could you vote for us? And then um, we made it in the top five. So then we had to do it again. Hey, thanks so much for voting for us. We made it into the top five. Um, so then we were like really hammering. I think I texted you every day. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> um, and then just yesterday or the day before yesterday, we got the big announcement that out of 200 businesses that applied um, and thank you to everybody who voted for Impact. We had something like 8,000 votes. Impact Martial Arts wins. So huge uh, win for us this week. Nice happy news in this tough time. Absolutely. It was amazing. And it's always refreshing to see. i not really surprised that our community, as far as World Tongue Sudo, uh, rallied around you. But, it, you know, it's still nice to see like, hey, everyone, you know, went out and yeah, it was just a button and you did it every day. But they, the fact that they did it was was pretty awesome to me. So. Yeah, we, uh, I started asking every region, even places that probably never heard of Impact Martial Arts, <laughs> lots of people, oh, happy to help, happy to vote, good luck, and it just speaks about what a great organization uh, we're members of. Absolutely. Uh, well, again, um, welcome to anyone watching, and again, we're with Master Angel Salona. So let's talk about how you started in this association uh, many, many years ago. So tell us about your backstory and, and how you got started in the martial arts. I actually like how I started. It's kind of a funny story. Um, I was 10 years old and my best friend said, hey, my little brother and sister have been taking karate classes at the rec center. Do you want to join with me? I think I want to do it. And I said, no, that's boys. <laughs> Um, and she twisted my arm and brought me along with her. And from the very first class, I absolutely loved it. Uh, the instructor was Master DeMarco, and it was at the Collingdale Recreation Center, just like local parks and rec. Uh, and that's where I got started. Awesome. Um, you said you were 10, right? So I don't know if you want to reveal how long <laughs> how long that makes you've been doing the martial arts about 25 years give or take <laughs> awesome and have you been active in that in the entire 25 years you've always yep no stopping for me that's cool um so w when you did that first lesson you continued to take the, the classes there um and then it eventually at some point moved to where Palche is? How far down the road was that? So I started in the Parks and Rec program where I lived and uh, Master DeMarco opened a studio in Collingdale, that town. Um, I don't know. I did the Parks and Rec for quite a while. Um, I don't know exactly how long that lasted, but um, he eventually opened a studio and I was able to test for Orange Belt there. And I went all the way to Blue Belt in that studio. And unfortunately, the studio closed. Uh, and that was in about 1998. And at that time, I spent a little time wandering around trying to find a karate school. It was a little difficult because I was a kid. <laughs> um, 
but I uh, was told by another person about Palche, uh, which really wasn't far away. Um, so I was able to join there after a little bit of searching. And um, as usually if people ask me what my studio is, I'll refer to Palche and say that Master Raver is my instructor. Awesome. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't get to meet, I think when you you promoted to your fourth Don, Master Raver came to regionals for that. I, I believe that was the, the first and only time I ever got a chance to, to meet him, but I, I heard lots about him. So maybe you could share a little about Master Raver. Sure. So he was so special to me um, and, and much more so than a, a karate instructor. Um, he taught me how to drive a car. Um, <laughs> he, he knew that uh, financially I wasn't in the best of shape when I was a kid and he was never one to promote tournaments. I think he shunned them more than anything, honestly. But um, I had won grand champion at a tournament. And he said to me, if you win grand champion at the next tournament, I'll buy you new sparring gear. <laughs> and I didn't win, but he bought it for me anyway. <laughs> um, so he was uh, super close with me and gave me lots of love as both a karate instructor and a um, important male role model in my life. Um, and one of the cool things about our relationship, um, learning from him as a studio owner is his studio, Palche, was never a commercial studio. Um, it was not there to turn a profit. It wasn't to make any money. Um, so it was only, he only did it because he loved it. Um, so he, you know, sometimes if you're running a karate school as a business, you have to be sensitive in different areas. And if you're not doing it in that way, you can lose those sensitivities and sometimes, you know, do whatever you want and not have to worry about repercussions. Um, and he certainly called it his labor of love and treated everybody the way he wanted to get the best martial arts out of him. Um, this weird story that I always remember. <laughs> I was 14, I think, when this happened. Um, and I was a scrawny 14-year-old. Uh, he put me and a bunch of other adult black belts in the room. And the Palche is like a super hot studio. In the dead of winter, it's like 90 degrees. In the summer, it's like 110. It's cold mm -hmm. in there. Um, so he put us all in this room and just left us there for an hour meditating. And I'm 14. What am I doing? I don't know. And then he comes back forever later and he just tells us to stand up. And he's like, Angel, can you break seven boards? And I was like, Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> he could not. He made me try. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, yeah, very random uh, story. <laughs> we, we got some people saying hi. Uh, Tom Lyon says hi. Master Lalo Valdez from uh, Region 12. Our buddy Lalo says hello. Um, hello. Brian Burkett says congratulations. <laughs> and then uh, Master Setianto asks, what happened to your colorful mohawk? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get the color redone. <laughs> Uh, that's one of the best kind of inside jokes uh, for those of you out there that aren't aware. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Master Salona constantly gets confused for Master Anna Setianto. Um, and vice versa. And vice versa. I'm still not sure why. I Maybe, maybe you guys are about the same t height. <laughs> but uh, I love it. It's, it's one of the funniest several years how many years has she had a mohawk that's been, I know. don't get confused <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious um i was in pre preparing for this interview i was trying to think of when the first time you and i met and i probably saw you in tournaments but the first time i really got a chance to hang out with you was at pam thompson's uh parties uh, Cause I know she trained at Palche and um, she was a, she's a, a great friend. I haven't talked to her in a while, but she's, she's awesome. She's always been a great. Yeah, I'm glad that you remembered that. Cause I was wondering that too. And I just 
came to terms with, I guess it was just a natural born friendship. We saw each other at events and Erin and I competed together. So we, we just met. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, it, I'm sure that was part of it. But then it was like, oh, hey, I know her from tournaments and stuff. Um, so going back, you started in Palche. When did you, when did you meet George? About when time, when did you? So when, <laughs> when I transferred to Palche, it was 1998 and he was already a student there, but he had transferred into Palche from Shin Karate. Yeah. We both transferred into the studio um, and met there. Gotcha. And so I guess, were you, were you friends for a while? And then how did, how did that uh, work out? Yes, absolutely. So um, there was a small group of teens in the studio who are all friendly. Um, and we were friendly and some other people that were friendly. Um, and so we'd go out and go bowling or whatever together. Um, and we dated. <laughs> I think I was like 13 for a couple months and then we took a break. And then when we were 15, we started dating <laughs> again. And then we've just been together uh, since then, since I was 15. Uh, so he's really been the love of my life and my one and only. And we have a, a sweet, sweet love story. <laughs> awesome. Um, we, Aaron and I, not that age, but about 10 years older, had that kind of same story where we would hang out with the same people and then it just kind of happened. <laughs> Got a couple more people saying hi. Uh, let's see, Randy Jeffries. Oh, hi, Randy. Dot, Dot Henrik. Hi, Dot. Uh, let's see, we got Nikki, Susie, Susie Carter. Uh, if anyone has a question for Angel, please feel free to share with us. I guess, well, right now times are kind of weird, but we just passed June with a lot of graduations and kids going off to college. Being one of the people that never stopped training, you know, whether it was teens or college or whatever the case may be, do you have any uh, tips or maybe advice for those, uh, you know, to try to balance the two? Yeah, so I did not ever stop training. I know a lot of uh, teens or college bound or college uh, students have a hard time maintaining their uh, training schedule. Um, or even, you know, maybe you maintained it through college, but then you get a job. How do you maintain that schedule? Um, for me, I always loved training. It was my number one thing. So um, that's what I wanted to do at every moment. I went to college full time and I worked three jobs while I was there and I still I didn't drive for a couple of my first couple of years in college, um, but I made it work. I found um, a studio that was close enough that I could bike ride to and I got my butt there when I could. Um, and I trained on my own on the weekends when I was home, I would train. So it's all about sticking with what's important to you and not letting distractions get in the way. You're going to be busy. You're always going to be busy. You're never going to get to a point in your life where like, I have all this free time. Nobody has that. Um, so you just have to prioritize and make the time. That doesn't mean you need to train for two hours every day, um, but put the time in where time is due because the more you get away from it, the more it becomes okay to not be there. So being there and being constant is what's going to keep you fueled and going um, and I see that a lot with my students, whether they're that age or younger or older, and I even see it with my own kids. So the consistency is important to keep, keep going and keep that motivation going. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. It's one of those where I talk to people like, well, you know, I want to lose a couple pounds and then I'll, then I'll get in or, or I won't wait, wait till this. And like you said, there's, there's no good time. Like if you feel the urge to do it, just jump in and, and get it done. I always share uh, Aaron's story. She started in college, right? She started in college and continued through medical school. So was it easy? I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy for you either, but it, it was something that you prioritized as something that, uh, you know, something that was of importance to you. 
and you stuck with it. So, um, that, that, like I said, I think that's great advice. Um, <laughs> Steve Phillips, one, you know, never one to stir the pot, uh, <laughs> Ask Tim, Tim versus Angel, Masters Camp point sparring match. Who wins? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Make that happen. Uh, I, I will share one of my, we've obviously sparred a lot and uh, have had the opportunity to train a lot together. There was one of, one of the sparring sessions on a Sunday and you and I are fighting and I just kind of let my guard down and all of a sudden I got roundhouse kicked in the face and it was one of those like slow motion, like my, my face goes this way, the mouthpiece flies across the floor, the, <laughs> the floor. And I was just like, that was awesome. I should not do that anymore. <laughs> the funniest part about that was how happy Aaron was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> certainly take my fair share of hits though well yeah. maybe more than my fair share I think we all have and you know that again what I especially like about training with you is how hard you work right and and you have that work ethic where it's like all right we're here to train let's train <laughs> I like to talk but we need to we need to do this You're like you prioritize that time as training time and and you need to make sure that that happens uh, has it always been that way Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably, is that how your training went with Master Raver? Like when you're in the dojang, you guys were training hard? Yes. Um, our classes were able to be an hour and a half long. Okay. Um, and, and Tungsudo Institute, which was Master DeMarco's school. So I probably, I would guess probably like when I was 11, um, is when that studio opened for me to go to from the park and rec to the studio. Anyways, um, I, I was just a worker bee. I loved training. I loved everything about it. Um, and the studio was pretty small and the kids program was also very small. And there was, um, I guess the kids were younger than me. I was 11, not super old, but anyways, Master DeMarco said, why don't you come into the adult class instead of the kids class. And I think the only reason was because I had that laser focus as a little guy um, and I just wanted to train so hard, um, even you know when I started and was new. And then in Palche, the classes, like I said, were an hour and a half, which is great. I, I like when we can have extra time in our classes too. Um, and Master Reaver, uh, one of the things he was known for was like I said, that studio is super hot all year round and he would never ever open the door. So you're just in this sweat box all the time. And like every now and again, he'd go and like turn the door handle and open it like, <laughs> and we'd be like, whoa. <laughs> um, so I think being coming up in these treacherous conditions just taught me how to be a workhorse um, and when it comes to training, I certainly do try my best and I might not be the best, but I'm going to try my best for sure. Absolutely. And that's, I, I, I probably say that every night in class, it's like, I don't need you to be perfect. I just need you to try hard. And, you know, you can obviously go far, uh, you know, with that mindset. Um, so let's go back to the timeline here. We have Palche. Uh, I don't know exactly the time frame. At some point, you started working with the the Petermans. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that? How that happened? And, and that was that a magical transition. I um, <laughs> I don't. I couldn't. I wish I could tell you the exact details, but I don't even know them. But somehow, Maggie Gonski, in her all knowingness, <laughs> knew me. I had no relationship with her, um, but she knew me. Master Peterman was looking for an instructor for a satellite location. Um, I got the recommendation from Maggie. Um, and uh, Master Peterman and I actually met formally for the first time at the interview um, with 
So he operated out of a YMCA and they wanted to open a satellite location. So the first time I formally met him was actually at this interview with the YMCA. And I remember him saying to me, oh yeah, I know you, good. <laughs> um, but it has been such a blessing in my life. He's my former formal instructor now. And I am so honored to have such a knowledgeable instructor who um, pushes me to continue to build my own skills, helps me when I have questions. Um, I feel like I have more questions than the average student and he's so patient with me um, and I get the bonus. Um, so he's my instructor, but I really also consider his wife, Master Nicole Peterman, one of my instructors too, kind of a dynamic duo. So uh, it's a two for one bonus. <laughs> Absolutely, if you're, yeah, if you're gonna have two people to, to look up to, those are two mighty fine instructors uh, to, to be a part of. Um, it's funny, in doing all of these interviews, anyone who's, well, pretty much anyone I talk to has stories of Maggie and she just had that uncanny, <laughs> like, um, you know, we talked about Pam. When Pam moved to Kennett Square, she, Maggie told her, hey, uh, Master Godwin's opening up a school in Kennett Square. You should go and do it and, and help them. And, and so she helped me for years at that at Dojang and she was just fantastic. And same thing, Aaron can tell you the same stories and even Nicole the same way. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of crazy, the kind of uncanny, like, hey, this person needs to go there. She just knew how people fit. So it's so weird, too, though, because all of those people you mentioned had some sort of affiliation with Shin Karate. Not me. I don't know how she put those puzzle pieces together, and I don't think I'll ever know. <laughs> could it, could, it could have been Pam. Maybe, yeah. I don't, she, I, I don't know if that was the time where she was in Philly because she trained at Shin for that time. So who knows? I'll ask her. Thank you, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple. Of, uh, so one of uh, she trains at Shoshin Karate, Kelsey Hallett. She says she remembers watching the competitions with uh, my wife, Master Aaron Watson, uh, and and competing with you. So let, let's talk about competition. You talk about when you were younger, you you won a grand champion, and then didn't win it, but still got sparring gear. Uh, <laughs> what what was competing for you uh like as a kid you know as an adult so as a kid i think just like any other kid it, it's fun to win it's fun to uh try something new um i knew i loved karate my first tournament i was a brown belt and i didn't really understand how they worked um and i there was like a you used to sign a physical paper form to, to go to the karate tournament. And I was like, how do you get invited to one of these things? So my instructor was like, oh, anybody can go. You can go. I was like, oh, I, I think I'd like to do that. Um, and uh, I was successful in the terms of placing at my first tournament. And I was like, oh, I, I like this. I mean, who doesn't like winning, right? So that confidence propelled me to keep competing. But once I hit black belt, it was a whole new level of competition. And I didn't place for a long time as a black belt. Um, I bumped up in age division and, of, of course, rank division. Um, and I just remember hearing all these whispers in my division was uh, Tatiana. And everyone's like, oh, Tatiana, she's so good. Oh, oh, I'm like, who is this person? So I bumped into her division and lots of other great uh, strong competitors in there. And I was not placing for, I don't even know how long, um, but I kept at it. Um, and uh, eventually I started finding myself on the podium, maybe one or two medals or, you know, wherever. Um, and like I said, my instructor, Master Raver, was not a tournament guy. So I was, I was a workhorse. Like I always trained super hard, but I was probably not tournament polished. You know, there's a lot of instructors who are like tournament driven. And I always kind of wanted to have one of those coaches like helping me shine every move. Um, and you could see that in their performance. So I ended up learning a lot 
about how to compete by watching the successful competitors, uh, including your wife. Um, especially <laughs> when I moved into her division, I was like, oh, that's how you're supposed to do that. <laughs> um, so I, I liked it first for like the thrill of winning, but then really it, it taught me um, a lot about how I wanted to do things by be, being in the ring with such strong competitors. You mentioned some names, but that, in that time frame, there were some really, really fierce competitors, uh, you know, Tatiana, my wife, Steph, then her, but Ma Brooke, her sister, Heather, uh, kind of pushed up. I, she's probably about the same age as you. I'm sure you competed with her. Um, Steph and I competed against each other a few times, but she was, I believe, a, a higher rank than me. I'm not sure her age difference, but um, we competed less than your wife and I, I believe, I think. Yeah, well, I, th yeah I think she yeah, Aaron was down a little longer um, in our, our regional. One of my favorite stories from competing, uh, it was uh, 2008, 2008 World Championships. That's we, everybody's favorite story. Well, for me, it was, I, I was competing and you and Aaron uh, were in another ring across the way. And I still remember um, his name is Gary, Colan Mr. Colangelo, and he had kids and, and he would go around and, and look at all the rings and, uh, I go, Hey, how's Aaron doing? He's like, Oh yeah, she did good. He's like, I don't know who that, that, uh, the really pregnant short lady is, but she was amazing. She was easily the best one out of that whole group. And I was like, uh, Oh, that's angel. She's like, yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> I, um, right before that I was a third degree, but right I guess the day of I was like going through my form and um the low low chop in Kung Sung Kun I could not do um or, or couldn't get out of if I could do it but I made a last second game change to do Jindo um and it worked out <laughs> that's awesome um cool looks like some of your <laughs> Steve said it's magical how her foot suddenly peers on the side of your head <laughs> and then uh, Jen says true story it's almost almost unrealistic looking sometimes the things she can do things she can make her body do love it <laughs> so um, let's let's transition to the story of impact martial arts and, and how that came about because again I, <laughs> it's funny going back to Pam I still remember she would come and help me but in the very beginning when you guys were in, I think Haverty Grace, was it Haverty Grace? Uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, she was helping out and I was like, oh wow, cause I grew up in that area. I grew up in Cecil County. So I thought it was cool that there was World Tongue Sudo in Cecil County. So um, talk about how you got started down in Maryland when you live the other way. <laughs> oh, I knew very early on in my training that all I ever wanted to do in life was run a karate school. I didn't know anything about how, and I was raised in a non-commercial studio. So just a studio that operated just to pay expenses only. Um, and I, I didn't know, I want a commercial studio. I want a non-profiting studio. I didn't have a clear vision. I just knew forever that that's what I wanted. I wanted a karate school. Um, so I was constantly seeking out areas to teach and I have tons of programs I've taught for different people under my belt of all, all types. Um, and we, I, so let's see, I was teaching at that satellite location for Master Peterman. And then when I graduated college, I had to say thank you very much for that opportunity, but I, can't continue teaching it. And he was able to pass that on to another instructor. Um, and I got a full-time job working in the city, but I still wanted to teach martial arts. So um, in the city being Philadelphia, I was constantly on the lookout for what could I do? Um, and I did a couple side jobs teaching martial arts with different programs. Um, and then George and I 
did not have at that time, this is before Master Peterman was my formal instructor. I had none. Master Raver had retired. I had not formally requested Master Peterman to be my actual instructor. Um, George was kind of in the same boat. We were kind of just floating around karate people with no instructors. And we were young and dumb and really needed guidance. Um, but we just, we, we tried to take whatever steps we thought were right. And some were, some lots weren't. We opened a program through the Cecil County Community College um, and we really enjoyed that. And then we weren't able to continue because it was infringing on other instructors, 15 mile zone. And if we had better guidance or we knew how, who to talk to, there's, I think a good chance I could have, or we could have worked that out and made that program continue. But we just said, oh, okay. And bagged it because we didn't know how to handle that conflict. But we didn't want to just stop the program. We had a handful of students in it and it was doing okay. So we decided that we were just going to open a full-blown commercial location outside of everybody's 15-mile radius. So uh, the closest we could get to our home outside of every other World Tongue Sudo Association's 15-mile radius, so we weren't impeding on anybody else's feet. Um, was Maryland. So, and we started in Aberdeen. We were there for a year. Um, we lost our lease and moved into Cecil County. And at that time we learned some things and how to interact with other humans <laughs> and ask Master Fisher, hey, Master Fisher, we're coming to this area. I, I think we had like, I think it was like 14.5 miles from his studio or something. And he said, yes, yes, go ahead and open there. Um, and so we opened in Perryville. And so we opened in Aberdeen in 2008 and then in Maryland and Perryville in 2009. In an old, I remembered it as a video store when I grew up as a kid. <laughs> when I first came, I was like, hey, I remember this building. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me how it works with you and George teaching, like, you know, your strengths versus his strengths. Like, how, how does that work? And how did you figure out how to make those things work throughout the years? Because I know having, having two instructors is not always the easiest thing. Yeah. I would say by and large, it's more positive by a lot than negative. There's certainly some times where we disagree, but those disagreements are gonna be where we find uh, good things out of. So like, I might think one thing and I can't see his point of view, but we're both like really hard headed people. So we have to just keep hammering that point until the other one gets it. So um, it really, even when we do disagree, I think it ends up working out for the best. Um, and I always tell our students, it's so beneficial to have a karate school that has two head instructors. Because a lot of karate schools just have one. So you get one point of view and that's it. That is all. Um, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have one instructor. There's certainly lots of amazing instructors who do that. Um, but by having two different perspectives, maybe something that works for me doesn't work for somebody else or what works for, you know, Mr. Salona might not work, but for the other one, they might have a different way to do it. So, and I'm a small statured person. Um, he's 5'10", so he's not huge, but definitely a more human size. <laughs> so if you have a small person, it's easier for me to say, oh, here's an adjustment you can make to make that work for you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Peterman is very tall. And I tease him for saying to me one time, I've created this self-defense technique for small people. I'm like, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it definitely is beneficial to have two different instructors with different viewpoints um, to be able to share, you know, the things we do differently. And um, we were teaching a, a Zoom together, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And um, for 23 hand steps, I always call it the rock the baby. 
want you to put your hands like this and you're going to put your elbow one down and one up. And I say, it's the rock the baby. You want that rock the baby motion. So Master Solana keeps seeing the end product, which is an elbow up. And he's like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, oh, oh, that's because of me. <laughs> I told them to do that so they can apply the arm bar. Um, so sometimes we don't even know what's going on because a lot of times we would alternate days. So he'd go one day and I'd go another day. So if he didn't know that exact terminology, he's like, what's going on there? And there's, there's a reason behind it. Um, I, I think we do a good job working together. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, the opportunities I've had to work with your students, I've always enjoyed working with them. And I, I think all of those values that you, you know, hold dear to your heart, you have instilled uh, in your students. Do you, do you find some similarities in what you, what Master Raver looked for you, looked in for you, uh, you know, as far as your students go? Or are you I sure harder? hope so. <laughs> harder? Who's harder on them? Is, are you harder or is George harder? Oh, I don't know. There's probably, you, you probably different, different hard. I don't know. You mentioned several of our students that were watching. I don't know if, if they have a, I don't know, a, a opinion on that. Um, but um, I will uh, comment. So we have a young black belt team and uh, we hosted a drum class two Saturdays ago. And we have this picture I was able to grab of her and it's her doing some jumping technique. So she's like flying in the air and in the foreground is master uh, George hitting the drum. And I was like, oh, this is such a cool picture because I mean, I could take it into so much symbolism about like her flying and him like leading and how like she's grown so much. And then I went back and looked and I have all these pictures from when she was super tiny and they were like hugging or high-fiving. <laughs> like, oh, she's grown up here, our little baby. Um, so we do our very best to form relationships and bonds with our students. Um, I was just lamenting the other day, one of the problems with the um, procedures we have to follow right now is I can't talk to any of the students after class. It's like, get in and get out, we gotta clean. Um, but a lot of time that in between class is when we get to work on building those relationships. So I can't wait uh, to have that time back. Absolutely, that's that's a great point. Um, these times have made things very odd <laughs> from, from, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday. It's like, I taught Zoom classes, you know, martial arts Zoom classes for three months. Um, but so real quick, I'm gonna, uh, I, I wanna talk about that, but quite a few people chimed in. Uh, it says, it depends on what we were doing. Randy Jeffrey says, Angel's cardio is like no other. And I, I can, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have felt those, cla those cardio classes, the cardio kickboxing classes where it's like, I don't want to do any more squats <laughs> and pushups. And then uh, uh, Claudia Martinez says hello, and she wants oh. to learn your self-defense for small people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when all this stuff was going on with COVID-19, I, I feel very uh, lucky to have been part of a group that was super um, like, okay, this is happening. Here's what we need to do. And you were kind of, you spearheaded that, at least in my opinion, and you were a, you said workhorse, you were a video making workhorse. <laughs> so oh my gosh. <laughs> tell us how you bolstered your, your YouTube and uh, your YouTube library. Okay. Um, I think before COVID we had like 15 or maybe 20 videos on our YouTube channel and they would be like summer camp or here was a kid that learned how to do nunchucks. I don't know. Nothing. Um, crazy off the wall. Um, and then it was becoming clear that we were going, no, it wasn't clear that we were going to close. It was clear that 
there was a possibility we could close. And we started talking, you and Master Satianto and the other instructors we train with in the morning. We should probably start doing some videos for students to have in case we close. So we're like, all right, next week when we get together, we're gonna do some filming. And that next week never happened. We all got shut down. I think I got shut down before you guys in Maryland. Um, that next week never ended up happening. Um, and at that time, we just thought it was a two week closure. So I was like, well, you know, I can do these videos. So I started filming videos um, and I was doing about eight every single day, eight every single day, hours and hours, just doing videos. And um, Mr. Nick D'Amato from Palche graciously let me use his studio to do the filming. And we did a lot right here in our basement too. Um, and then after we put out, I think like 40, and we pared it down, we're like, all right, we're gonna try and do 10 a week. And then we continued with that 10 a week for weeks and weeks. Um, and George and I were both doing them and we both had days where we would knock out a whole bunch of them and, or a day when we come home and we would just be like, oh my gosh, I tried to do this video five times. It didn't work. I did all that time for nothing. Um, one of George's most miserable was he was trying to do a set on push-up strength. And it was, I don't know exactly what the exercise were, but they were all push-ups. And I think it was like a 20 minute video. And it, he like did it once and like the camera was wrong or something. And then he had to do it again and it still failed. He's like, I cannot possibly do any more push-ups. <laughs> done. And he was so frustrated. And the next day he got up super early, left and went and successfully recorded <laughs> push-up video. Uh, he's like, I'm going to get this done. Um, but I certainly had the same experience with some of mine. Um, but we wanted to make sure we were providing our students with a lot of value. So we did online classes, um, but some people didn't have Facebook. Some people didn't like Zoom. So we also made tons and tons of YouTube videos, and then we would put them in playlists. So if you're not being able to attend one of those online classes, here is another alternative to get your training in. Yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. And I encourage anyone watching to go to the Impact Martial Arts uh, YouTube page and you will find some of those uh, soul crushing cardio workouts for kickboxing. <laughs> the kickboxing workout videos are to me hysterical because it was a one woman show. I did the camera. I did the, the editing, I did the cardio, and I never knew this, but doing a cardio kickboxing workout while recording yourself is like five times harder than just doing the workout. Absolutely. Constantly like, <sighs> like I lost count or I forgot what time we were on. They're all, they all have some really weird, to me, hysterical facet in them somewhere. Um, but they, they get the job done. <laughs> um, going back, so since you've been around, when did, what year did you say you started training? In the uh, 1994. 1994. So uh, we were very fortunate to have Grandmaster Shin in our region. So if you could share us, it's crazy when I look back, like, um, I guess both of uh, your daughters and my daughters never had, they were, they had started training after Grandmaster Shim was gone. And there's a couple of, uh, you know, generations of black belts that never got a chance to train with him. So could you share some stories? Sure. Um, I think that I'm an actually very unique instructor uh, at this rank, because while I do have a handful of stories that I would be happy to share about Grandmaster Shin, I do not have a super close relationship with him that I feel like most of my peers and instructors ahead of me did because he was such a people person and formed relationships with so many instructors. I think that I'm um, the unique beginning of that next generation of people who didn't get to have those relationships. And then there's people, instructors now that never trained under him at all and even some who have never met him. Um, 
So I'm certainly in that middle ground. Um, I, was, I think our whole generation was kind of in that. He was there. He would be there for black belt uh, camps and things like that. But the generation before us, like the Master Robinsons and Master Tories, definitely had a uh, you know a stronger relationship than than we did. So you're 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 not alone. I think that's kind of our whole. I was a little bit after you, but kind of that same same time frame. Yeah. So when I was a teenager, the black belt camps was still a mixed adult and kid camp. Um, and one of my first experiences with Grandmaster Shin was we were outside in the field uh, doing forms to the drum and he had the drum in the middle and the, the lines broke. So we were both facing in with the, him in the middle. And I, I guess I was like 13, 14, somewhere in there. And he wasn't happy with the way the forms were being done. <clears throat> this little, you know, Korean guy who I've never met before was slightly terrifying. Um, and he goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> He's yelling at everybody. He's like, oh, we better do this really good. And then, you know, everybody goes more intense after this. And he goes, now you look like black belt. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so that was one of our first, my first experiences with him. Um, but I have always been, I still am super starstruck by our senior masters. So getting to meet Grandmaster Shin was always like something that was out of my league. And the one time I was at headquarters and I walked up the steps and he was standing um, at the front of the stairs. So what any normal person would have done was bow and say, hello, sir. But what I did was go, <gasps> it was just like, stuck in my tracks. I never bowed. I was completely frozen. Um, and he just went into his office and, you know, carried on with his business. But I'll always remember not bowing to the grandmaster. Um, but like I said, I never had that close relationship with him. And at an instructor class he was teaching, I was doing something incorrectly. And he said, Angel, and he corrected me. And I was just lost in my tracks that he knew who I was. I was like, he knows my name. How does he even know that? And again, it just goes to speak about what uh, a people person he was. And he kept after everybody, whether you knew it or not. I didn't know he had a clue who I was. I was certainly way, way, way in the back of that room. Um, but he knew who I was by name and uh, made it a point to fix my uh, things that were wrong and I will do my best to to do things like that too. Awesome. You you talked about doing forms by the drum at Black Belt Camp uh, and one of the we don't do it anymore now that we're masters but one of the the great things of Black Belt Camp is doing the Basai by the drum and I was like I we did some forms by the drum the other night and I was trying to explain to the kids that kind of sensation of being around everyone and doing forms by the drum, you know, share some stories on that or just black belt camp stories in general. Oh, the drum is the best. <laughs> we actually hosted a drum class for our students um, a couple Saturdays ago and the feedback was great. They, they loved it. Um, so I told you already about Grandmaster Shin. Um, so I think one of the things that stands out to me the most is after attending clinics for years and years, I started actually creeping towards the front of the lines and I would have these battle buddies that we would kind of all clump together and push each other. Um, so I would get to stand near uh, your wife and Ariel Sakula, Faith Gordon Mazur, um, Martha Heiss, all these like super strong, athlete, competitor, warrior, martial artists. Um, and there was absolutely at no point in time where you could not give 100% because you are just surrounded by all stars. So, you know, you would get done and just be drenched, you know, and there's nothing like it. And um, definitely something that is sorely missed this year without having camp. 
Absolutely. I was sitting with the kids last week or on like Friday afternoon. I was like, we should be getting rid of you and going to camp. <laughs> 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 so transitioning from black belt camp to then getting the invite to master's clinic. Did you ever think like as a kid, was that one of your like, I'm going to go and you, you said you always wanted to teach was master in, you know, on your radar at all? So when I started the amount of masters, I wish I knew it was like, I feel like minuscule. I remember if I saw a Samdan at a tournament, I was like, oh my gosh, this person is a Samdan. Like it was amazing. So like reaching master and the masters were like the, there are our, our giants now. So like master Chambliss and um, master Fattori, master Vaughn, like the, Casarano, like these are the people we were looking up to. I I couldn't put myself on their footing. Um, and like I said, even a Samdan was like incredible. So I never had like extreme goals where I was like, I'm gonna be a master. And at some point, I don't know when exactly, but the directive came down that as a studio owner you could become a master, but only one master per studio. Mm -hmm. I opened the studio together and we wanted children. Um, I was actually pregnant when we opened Impact. Um, and I was very interested in everything motherhood. So I was like, this makes the most sense for you to go after that master's rank. I, my motherhood is my priority right now. Um, and we did that and I came, it, it sucked, but I came to terms. I was like, this is what I really, what I want to do. You could take away my belt and give me nothing. I will still love martial arts. I will still train hard. I don't care. I just want to teach. I want to train and I'm okay with this being the way it was. And then we were so happy when we found out a couple of years later, Hey, now we're going to say, um, you can have an additional master in your studio if you have this student count. Um, so then it became really exciting for me to be able to go after that rank. Could you tell us some uh, your thoughts like that first year going to master's clinic and the, I think we all have, obviously I know your story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we always, you know, just thoughts in general on master's clinic. I know that you're, you're a very calm and laid back and uh, never nervous or anxious person, so. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, if you're watching this, that's 100% the opposite. Um, so um, as a kid, I had very, 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 very severe anxiety. And it just wasn't like a diagnosed thing then. I was just like this weird kid. And um, my parents both worked multiple jobs and had four kids. so just like take care of yourself, you know? Um, and uh, when I was in college, I had such a severe anxiety attack at one specific, there was one specific uh, event that was so um, facilitating in my life that I really had to um, take a hold of my own mental state. And I did a lot of work on myself at that point um, to get myself more clarity and how I was managing my mental self. And when master's camp came around, I really, really struggled with so many internal questions. Am I good enough to be here? Am I worthy to be here? Um, I, don't, I don't know what I expected out of that test, but when it ended up being a tongue pseudo test, I was like, oh my gosh, I know tongue pseudo. <laughs> I can do this. It was a little bit relieving for some reason I had like this crazy expectation that they were going to ask all of these things I wouldn't know how to do of me um but George had went before me and he wouldn't tell me anything he's like you just have to go I, I can't give give it to you you'll just see it when you get there um and when we were there he was like why aren't you more excited I just thought you would be more happy why aren't you more excited and I was like, this is so stressful for me. 
that I have to take any excitement I have and just suppress it so I can maintain a level of sanity. I couldn't enjoy it because of the, the anxiety. And Mr. Fattori, I don't know when I heard him say this, but I agree 100% with him. He said he created his own personal hell for himself with camp. And I did that with not doing it on purpose. It was just how my body physically reacted to that sort of stress. Um, but once we got onto the test floor and I knew what I was doing, I knew how to do Tong Sudo. And I was so happy to be paired up with Master Setianto, um, somebody I'm super comfortable training with. I was like, yes, <laughs> I got this, I can do this. Um, and then going back the second year, I was able to be, uh, I was able to enjoy it more. Um, and as stressful as it was looking back, they're all happy memories. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you sharing with us uh, because you know, watching Master Robinson's interview, um, and I, I, I shared this with a couple people, like, like you said, some people, and it's weird to, I'm, I'm, I'm not labeling us in this, you know, but we're masters at this point. So people look up to, to, to someone who has the rank of master and to realize that we're all human and we all have worries and concerns and we get in our head too much. Like that's real. Like that happens to all of us. And, you know, the fact that you worked on it and got past it and, you know, are an amazing martial artist and mom and friend, um, you know, that you, you wear all of those hats and you wear them well, but it doesn't always come easy. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting, actually, believe it or not, it's, uh, one, we, we're getting close to our hour mark. Um, are there any things that we, looks like we covered all my questions. Anything you want to, you want to finish? with or, or share that we didn't, haven't touched base on? Hmm. Um, I guess what? just encouraging everybody, you know, I know that right now training is difficult. We, we can't, um, I keep saying we can't punch and kick each other. You know, we, we're doing everything social distance. So even when things are challenging, now is the time to buckle down. I think that the Number one thing I've learned in martial arts as a business owner, as a student, as an instructor, the overall lesson is just because something is no right now doesn't mean no forever, or maybe it means maybe later, or maybe it means something else. So right now we have these limitations on our training, but that doesn't mean don't train. So make the best out of what we have right now. There's always something we can work on, always something we can get better at, and then apply it to uh, our training later when we can be uh, actually kicking and punching each other. Awesome. And again, your story just, you know, uh, emphasizes that kind of journey. <laughs> like, even if it's not now, it'll, you just keep plugging away and, and, and stay strong. Um, you, you guys are back into doing some, some classes in the studio. How are you, tell us about, you know, when you, your, your grand reopening and, and how that went. Um, so we are open in the studio and we have, uh, we're still learning. So we spaced out the time in between classes so we can clean, um, and we're doing a lot, we mop the mats, we're cleaning all the door handles. If any equipment gets used, we're cleaning that. If the bathroom gets used, we're cleaning that. Um, we brought, bought an air purifier. Um, so that's like our number one priority is making sure that people are safe when they're here. Um, and then while we're on the floor, because we can't do interactive physical drills, um, the last two weeks that we've been open so far, we've been doing a lot of bag work um, because it's 
uh, safe to hit the bag and good to hit something for sure. So a lot of people miss that. Um, even holding targets isn't um, able to be done yet. So hitting the bag has been a good um, outlet for us. Um, and I think that it also provides us opportunity to work on uh, some fine tuning things. I know my students loved, we worked on leg extension drills last week um, and just making sure we could, you know, fine tune that area. So it, it does give us opportunity to work on something that maybe we wouldn't otherwise. Absolutely. I found myself doing the same thing and just coming up with trying to keep things, you know, if we just do forms every time someone walks in, they're, they're going to get tired of it. So being, uh, you know, improvising and coming up with new stuff is, is good. All right. I'm going to finish. <laughs> I just got one last question for you. Um, uh, Evolution Karate Academy asks, have you ever done forms on broken glass? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will deflect that to the amazing <laughs> Mazer, Faith Gordon Mazer, who I don't know about forms, but definitely did the spinning wheel kick break on glass. That's nice. Yeah, I, uh, I never knew she did that. I'll have to, I, I have an interview with her next week on Wednesday, so I'll have to talk to her about that. I know Master Godwin did that, but I didn't know that she did, so. I think it might have been a, maybe a reference to that. You're probably right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Well, we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, Thank I, you for interviewing me. <laughs> uh, as I told you that we would have plenty to talk about. We, we filled an hour, so. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully soon on it's Thursday, we'll get back to our Thursday trainings and uh, we'll see each other in person. So that's great. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Thank you.